So now this evening, our guest um, is Duncan Coombs, uh, who I have known for uh, 20 years, Duncan. Quite a while, I think, yeah, no, yes, quite a more, while. Yes. Maybe more than that, more than that. Yeah, maybe, yeah. I don't know, time yeah, flies yeah. when you're enjoying yourself. Uh, one of those kind of bedrock characters of British horticulture, a lifelong uh, researcher and, and teacher. Um, I mean, I always think he stays so amazingly cheerful for somebody who has been in further education for, for such a long time. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, somebody who's got enormous experience, a great ability to, to communicate. And this is going to be one of our desert island garden uh, shows, whereby we ask people to... Th- uh, suggest and talk about and show us images of the gardens that they would fantasize about if they were stuck on a desert island or in some other situation where they have only their own mind to uh, to to uh, entertain themselves with. So um, now, Duncan, perhaps um, before we start on that, perhaps you'd like to say a few words about you know, about your career, who you are. Um, for those right. the nicest folks who do not know you. Right, okay, people that don't know me, what am I going to say? Uh, I trained originally in horticulture, then I went into botany, did a degree in that, and as Noel was intimating, I did a bit in, bit in research for a few years, um, worked for places with people like ICI, you might remember, um, did quite a lot with those, also um, Smith Klein Beecham, still operating in a big way. Um, then eventually I went back to my original roots, back to horticulture, and um, started lecturing at Pershall College, Pershall College of Horticulture, as it then was. And um, I'm still at it, I suppose, um, nearly 40 years further on. I officially retired a few years ago, but as no one knows, I do quite a lot of other things as well. Um, I'm very keen, I'm still very interested in horticulture and all things botanical. And during my careers, I'll say I've done quite a bit of traveling. And as I say, we're not finished yet. So still looking to travel, although the um, era of COVID rather spoilt things. So yeah, this evening I'd like to show you, I've taken, I was taking Noel a bit late in the day, I've taken rather a, a broad brush approach to Noel's request about, I think it was five gardens, you said Noel. So we're probably going to five different continents, but I'm sure that won't, won't affect things. So yeah, I just like to sort of reminisce in a nice kind of way and um, you know talk about the things that have interested me things that still interest me and hopefully will interest you as well how's that not is that reasonable sort of intro you've gone very quiet Noel. you've muted your screen screen, then do please um okay share screen screen. right here we go and i'll make a start just just bear with me a minute folks here we go um that's that's it that's it just a second here we go that's it. Okay, there we go. Now, just be with me in it, a minute, folks. That's better. Is that all right with everybody? Noel, is that okay? Hope it is, right? So, I can see it. I can see it. And if I well, can see it, well done, Noel. Noel. That's it. So, yeah. and you can hear me nicely as well, Noel. Yes. I can hear you now. Okay. Love. So, there we are. I've just entitled this little talk Great Gardens that Influenced Me During My Career. And so, I've been a little bit. And I should say my career to date, because I'm still intending to carry on doing some research and working in horticulture and in botany. So one garden, which I expect is familiar to many of you, and quite rightly so, is the RHS Gardens at Wisley. And I've probably been visiting there probably makes me feel very old, really, over 50 years. And some of this being constant has been the laboratory building here we can see in front of us that's currently been done up some of you may know it's been changed into a really a museum as long as i've known it's been active and much used building and then in the front you can see what they call the canal and those that may be as long in the tooth as myself will know that it hasn't always been the canal and i can remember in the dim and distant past where there used to be a lovely whole series of what I suppose we call today vinery greenhouses, and they were filled with a masses of different plants. But you know, things change, things move, and things improve. Um, that's the greenhouses are gone, the canal is there, and we'll see about the greenhouses a little bit later on. Again, something that we're all familiar with at Wisley is the Dare Old Rock Garden. That's still there, and some people might criticize it for being rather old fashioned, but it does have a lovely collection of plants and 
having looked at it for so long, it does change, folks. You do find that the plants come and go and change. So that's nice to see something stable, the rock garden. Um, the rose garden, well, there's been several. <laughs> and this is what they now call the old rose garden, which has now gone. And if you're wondering where it is at Wisley, it's where now the uh, tropical garden is currently. So that's changed, but we've still got roses, but that is one of the things that have changed. The conservatory, that was built, I know we haven't done my research a few years back now, but it's still a wonderful greenhouse. And for people that haven't been in it or experienced it, I recommend you do. Lots of different environments, extremely interesting, and some very nice planting. You can see some of these really modern style herbaceous plantings that are surrounding the building. They're worth a look as well. Um, something that was new was the introduction of sculpture to the garden and um, some colleagues even older than myself didn't like this at all breaking with tradition and what have you but something like this called about to take off I think we can all relate to that and think well that's nice figurative quite amusing some I a uh, little bit surprised about like spring 2021 by Philip Haas that I think probably made us all laugh it was a bit of a shock to see it there and even more shocking when you got that close as well but when you do get that close you can see it is really quite clever all the components of flowers or seeds or whatever so um something that maybe you know somebody like me who's a bit dyed in the wall makes you think there is more to horticulture and flowers and perhaps what i think about so fair enough um also wisley of course has got a beautiful very comprehensive collection of plants. I'm forever visiting and having a look, been there I don't know how many times. This is one of my absolute favourites, this Magnolia Leda. There's lots of magnolias there, the magnolia collections up and down the country, but this one for me with that pure white flower so delicately poised like that, that is a real beauty. Another garden, the whole garden created within Wisley Gardens generally is the Winter Garden. That's a relatively recent uh, creation. And it, it, it was quite interest, interesting, really, looking at many gardens. Um, many gardens just after this realised that to have a Winter Garden is also a good move financially because, of course, most of your visitors come in the summer, spring, the summer, what have you. But to get them in the winter, it greatly helps your cash flow. So if you're looking in the UK, which is what I'm really familiar with, you've got lots of the great and the big gardens, some of the not so big as well. They've all instigated and started to plant and to develop winter gardens. And it's, it's important. We're obviously in our gardens 12 months of the year and to have a good winter garden or a section of garden devoted to winter. Good idea. Here's just a sort of shot I got one day. And this is the new entrance. I haven't actually got a picture of the new entrance of winter at Wisley, but you can see how it's radically changed, a tremendous building going on there. So there's the new entrance under construction, which most of us will know now it's finished. And it's a very big building and a wonderful plant centre there. Um, very interesting range of, of plants and all sorts of other sundry items there as well. So, almost worth a visit just on its own without the garden. And there it is under construction. Got some rather wacky plants there as well. If you like the sort of unusual things, well, this is our creticum, which that stage, all you've got is the spade and spadix there. That was in the Alpine house a few years back. And it, it was just nice to see something really off the wall slightly, I thought. And of course, perhaps more seriously, uh, it does have very rare plants and unusual plants and this frank linear um, this is very rare in, in north america where it comes from very rare very ancient interesting from a botanical point of view but there it is flowering at wisley they've got one it's a gorgeous flower let me show you related to the camellias and what have you reckon to be very very ancient and primitive and still at least extant at wisley nice to see that active conservation going on in the garden Moving on. Okay, it's still at Wisley, so I forgot my sequence, but you've still got these beautiful displays. Uh, this is, I think, was taken maybe this year, I think, and a lovely spring display on magnolias and lots of ericaceous plants on the Surrey uh, green sands they have there. Very nice to see. And finally, 
uh, to complete the story, having looked at Wisley for, I say, over 50 years, the newest and the latest is the Hilltop building, which I think is a quite a beautiful, it's modern, but it's a beautiful building. I think it's very, very attractive and it's hopefully going to serve the RHS well. It's got the library in it. It's got all the new science facilities and all sorts of things for interesting, bringing people into the sort of scientific community and showing them um, what the work of the RHS is all about and a whole series of smaller gardens, well-being gardens around, which very topical because of course, well-being and problems associated with COVID and what have you. We now found that gardening has been recognized, I think quite rightly, as a very good form of therapy if you're suffering from stress and what have you. And the gardens around Hillthorpe have been designed to try and help with that. And also they're actually being used, again, I mentioned research. The actual design of them is being researched to look at the actual effect of the environment and the plants it has on people. Something which is very difficult to study, but doesn't, I think, we'll all agree, because it's difficult, it doesn't mean we shouldn't study it and try and optimise the effects. So there, having sort of observed Wisley uh, for many years, still continuing to look at it. Another garden which has um, featured a lot in my career is this Spetchley Park Garden, which is a little at a little place called Spetchley near Worcester in England. And it's featured for several reasons. Let's have a little look at it. Here we go, there's a shot of it. It starts with a big, uh, especially hall where this mansion, but that's not really of relevance to my story. Um, you've got there a rare plant sale, which is, which is interesting. But I've taken there students around this garden for probably the last 40 years. I've got quite a good relationship with the head gardeners have been several in my time. And some of you may know the garden. It's interesting from several points of view. It's got a very, very good plant collection. So students learning plants and learning about their diversity, good opportunity. And also from a garden design point of view, it's got some historical relevance as well. Let me just show you, there's a plan of the garden. And um, I just use my pointer, there's the, the main building. But of interest, it's an old garden. It's got a lovely old wall garden there with a kitchen garden within it, which is still functioning. It's got the fountain gardens, which I'll say a little bit more of in a minute. And this south border, which is a feature, oh, my point has disappeared. Isn't that annoying? Just a second. There we are. And the south border there, I'll show you some of these interesting features the, the um, garden itself has got. Now we suddenly change and we've got a picture of Rosa Ellen Wilmot. During its speech, actually, it's quite an unusual rose. Most of us, I suspect, don't know it, but it is of significance because because Ellen Wilmot herself was a famous, um, extremely wealthy lady who managed to bankrupt herself by gardening. And one of the ways she did this was gardening with her sister who was actually married to one of the Barclays who own especially. So the story goes that the two sisters garden quite furiously especially, and there's a lot of things that tell us about what she was doing in the way of introducing plants, paying for people to go and collect and bring them here, and actually working on the garden with a sister. And the garden has got lots of very interesting features. Let me just show you one or two. Here we've got quite a famous, very long south facing border. And it's technically mixed, but mainly herbaceous with a beautiful collection of plants. Midway along, you've also got an interesting temple and more plants moving on. Now, opposite there, that you could say is a sort of typical Edwardian kind of feature. And on the other side, again, We've got actually a whole iris, well, you could almost call it an iris garden. And that is still maintained. That's almost a current photograph there. <coughs> and again, that's the students can look at the range of the, the Beardy iris, but also learn something about the design of gardens and their historical context. I haven't actually got any pictures, but over the hedge you can see there, you have four sections which are, well, not really um, kept up as much as they can these days, but those known as the fountain gardens. 
And that's where these two ladies I mentioned earlier did a lot of their gardening. And if you go in there and wander around, you'll find some extremely old specimens. And I can only speculate that some of them probably are in original introductions, paid for, you know, their introduction, paid for by the Wilmot. Other features which are interesting, they've got a beautiful Victorian summer house, which was fairly recently restored. And if you're teaching anything about uh, summer houses, conservatories and their design, this I think emanates from India, the, the, the basic design. And those of you that are into design of these things, you can see that it's extremely well ventilated. For instance, along the side here, all the panels come out, there's adequate top ventilation, and it's beautiful in the summer. It doesn't get too hot and it retains the warmth well in the winter. So it's a good pair of design, something the students can have a look at and study and perhaps admire. The arts and crafts movement, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with that. Um, it emanated in the Cotswolds, not terribly far from here. And you can see the influence especially. And we've got this rustic summer house, you know, local materials, local labour built it, and it features in lots and lots of books about the arts and crafts movement, very influenced, influenced strongly, especially. And I won't go on too long, but look at that beautiful ornamental period bridge as well. You can go on and on, there's lots of things, beautiful, especially. But there we are, another garden they built quite recently, so the garden's still evolving. This is a centennial garden which they built to commemorate the year 2000, obviously, and that I won't go into details unless you'd like me to later on, but beautifully planted. Um, they've got um, lottery money as well. They've been awarded money. And again, the students can see this, what's happening. They've got a very old lake here, well over hundred years old. It had silted up and you can see they've paid, have it dredged and all the walling all the way around, renewed, replaced, repaired and that happened a couple of years ago and it now looks something like that so the garden's still living still with a lovely plant collection and being restored in all sorts of ways and then finally just to make the point it's also got a lovely plant collection i've said here we've got a nissa this is an unusual one nissa aquatica and there it is going a bit closer in its autumn glory so you can you know, show them unusual species in the hope that later on, as many of them do, they develop, they do well, and they're in a position where they can plant some of these perhaps rare, unusual, desirable species. Ah, now talking of students here, here we are still at Spetchley, and you can see what my theme is here. A lot of students, which when I was teaching, they would have sort of sandwich years of various different formats, and Spetchley was useful because they would take students, such as we can see here, and give them a basic practical training. Lots of practical work for them to do there. Really excellent. And we've got a very good relationship still with the gardens. Again, Spetchley was a little bit ahead of its time in many ways, because it's had this Lillian Martigan naturalized in a large area of grass for probably at least 100 years. So this is obviously, you know, what people are supposed to be doing now, this more naturalistic style of planting. Well, here it is especially, they've been doing it for a long time. And although Martica and Lillian Martin is not native to the UK, it is in the rest of Europe, and it's naturalised nicely here. And you can see a general shot, there's a close up of Martican itself. And um, it's also got, I think, the only place I know where this lily, which I think is Lillian Civitianum, this was very curiously um, naturalized in this garden as well. It's a slightly more rare, unusual lily, bigger than Lydia Martigan, with a slightly unfortunate scent, to be honest, but wonderful to see it there and sustaining itself in this nice garden, especially. Moving on, uh, I said to Noel at the beginning, I'd be a little bit liberal in my approach. So, other series of gardens that have really influenced me and interested me, especially when I began to get interested in gardening design, were the classical scholar gardens of China. And mainly, as most of you will know, situated in the cities of Suzhou and uh, lesser so 
but still interestingly so in Wuxi, a city not far actually from Suzhou, which is on the eastern side, um, sort of halfway up of China. And I'd just like to show you very quickly gardens which I've visited on several occasions. So I'm just going to whiz through quickly. Hopefully it'll stimulate some interest. But um, here we are in the humble administrator's gardens. Amusing because it's by far the biggest, so it wasn't really very humble. And some of the architecture you can see there, the mountain in view tower, quite breathtaking. And thinking of the age of these buildings as well, some of them go back to 1060 something. So very, very old indeed, some of these buildings. Lovely to look at both in general outline and in detail, their construction. Other features such as the moon gate, and of course you can see here nicely positioned. So it's got what I call the come hither factor. It shows you so much of the garden, but not all of it. And we're all human, we're all curious, we want to walk through and see what's in the next section of the garden. That's very typical of these Chinese gardens, giving you a series of views. You can't see the whole thing in one glimpse. You're taken on a journey. And Penjing or Bonsai, if, if you're um, a Japanese, Penjing slightly different because it really means miniature landscape. And this one, I think, depicts it nicely where you've got a miniature landscape with the rock there. You've actually got a water feature because it's a dish should be full of water and then you've got the miniature trees as well and uh, a lot of the I gradually learned that a lot of the Chinese the way they appreciate things is very different from ourselves and they'll look at say this particular penjing and imagine themselves in that situation and you know achieve some kind of peace and happiness so they do that a lot in their gardens especially with this penjing Another garden I've visited, Master of the Nets Garden, very famous. I'll just show you some general views there. You'll never get them without any visitors because the Chinese appreciate them as well. But you can see again, very beautiful architecture. Here, yeah. I'd just like to point out, you can see things that go back a very, very long time, like these, these actual sitting area here, that sort of design you can see in, in various silk embroideries and what have you, go back centuries and they're still there and they're still used in the same way by the Chinese because that particular point there is called, I think, something along the lines, listening to the wind through the pine trees. The idea is just to the left of the picture, there is a pine tree. And of course, when these gardens were created, there were no internal combustion engines, it was peaceful. And the gentleman, the owner, the probably retired civil servant, fabulously wealthy, he'd sit just where that lady with the yellow cardin is, sit there and do just that. It's worth a thought, isn't it? They appreciated these sort of things way back then. Also, these lovely pictures, picture windows like this with the beautiful fretwork, and then in this case, the bananas, the lighting thought about as well. So you get literally a lovely picture. There's lots of these um, partial views. It's all cleverly thought out. And as I say, you're taken on a journey through these gardens. You're not supposed to have any idea how big the garden is, where you've been. It's the experience as you walk through the garden you're supposed to enjoy. There's another shot of the same garden. The pebble mosaics have always interested me as well. You can see this one here, quite a nice one. And they're very symbolic as well. So you can ask and re research and find out what the, um, the stalk and the pine actually represent. And, uh, ah, this is nice. I've just noticed as well, you can see in this one, if I just use my pointer, looking around, you've got bats all around. And that's an, you know, a bit of an obscure one where the word for bat and the word for joy are actually the same in Chinese. And this can be interpreted as you look at it there, that you've got the bats form a complete circle. And in a way, the, own, the owner is wishing you, the viewer, eternal joy. Quite a thought, isn't it, really? Here we go. 
the Stone Forest Garden, again, I've visited it several times. It is interesting. This is one of the entrances. And again, you can see it's very unusual to have a gate that, that a gateway sort of that sort of shape. So interesting. We go in and in those days, it was very much about prestige. These were very, very wealthy people. So there's the main hall, uh, quite intimidating. And you're going there to meet the master and you go in. And the reception area again very impressive and uh, designed to impress one so you're on best behavior you've got your finery on and you meet the owner and his family and there is a section of the stone forest again to westernize very difficult to interpret a lot of people don't like them but there it is worth starting a little bit and stone forest and indeed individual huge water-worn limestone rocks like this and again i've tried to make inquiries about these what it is that they'll stand and look at them for ages but again i think the answer is in the mind's eye the viewer if i just use my pointer they might well imagine that they're actually there standing in this in this huge landscape of which this rock is the main part and they're you know there and experiencing a completely different situation Again, in many situations, in many gardens, you find they have something like, I think one comes to mind, the five peaks. And there are five rocks placed. And the idea is that it represents a place in the limestone landscape where there are those five peaks. And the owner may well have come from that area in China, but rather than going there to see them, he's bringing the five peaks to his garden and experiencing them by looking at these rocks and imagining where he is. So it's a different way of enjoying your garden. I've also traveled a lot in Western China. And again, I said to Noel, it was gonna be a bit of a broad, so if I can imagine Western garden, uh, Western China as one big garden, which it is to me, it's beautiful. And again, I've been lots of times, I've been extremely lucky. I've had friends in, in academia, in uh, in china and they've been very good and very kind and we've done lots of trips together and i just show you guys like this because you will meet some extraordinary characters and uh, you know that guy and you think what he's experiencing in life totally different to ourselves here's another one look at that look at those eyes the piercing eyes this is a yi lady and it sort of relates to the fact that in yunnan southwestern china You've got lots of these ethnic minorities, as Chinese call them. I think there's over 20 of these little local tribes. And um, I know it's a bit controversial, but these tribes I'm talking about, they're not penalized at all. In fact, they're actually encouraged by the government. They're looked after by the government and they're still there and they're very proud. And they're, they're like this lady, they wear their traditional garb and a lot of their, their um, local traditions carry on as well. Some of them are really lovely. I can remember being standing by the Yangtze and watching all these ladies moving in, in motion with the skirts swaying, They're doing a nice, lovely traditional dance. I think it was a spring, you know, welcoming the spring and things like that. So this sort of thing is still going on in China in 2022. Um, talking of, of Southwestern China, place I've been back to many times, Kunming, which is the capital, and I'm just going to briefly show you the old time, the botanical gardens and just touch and Chinese students just touch on them. The old town, there it is. But in fact, it's not the old town. This is a recreation of the old town, um, which was wonderful in Yunnan, in, sorry, in Kunming. But unfortunately, it's gone now. But I would point out that other cities just as interesting, like Dali, also in Yunnan, where there is the modern city, but they've also preserved the old city and there's some wonderful things you can see there. So still nice here in Kunming, but not genuine. Oh, that's it. Now, we are now actually in the botanical gardens, quite an important one from the whole world's point of view, just one of about at least 30 botanical gardens in, in China. And I just thought I'd try and just mention one plant, this Mahonia, Mahonia ovacensis subspecies lamorifolia. There it is, 
growing in the botanical gardens and it is of relevance because this species or this subspecies was introduced by China from China by Lawrence Johnson, which I'm sure many of you know, very famous gardener who was amongst other things, creator of Hidcote Manor Gardens. So you've got a direct link then with the, the UK plant introductions and this botanical gardens we're talking about here. And I've visited the botanical gardens in Portman. It's got a very good plant collection. It does an awful lot of work with plant conservation in China. And it's also got a huge seed bank and it works in, in cahoots with, with Kew Gardens. They use the same uh, seed preservation techniques and uh, swap, swap seeds and ideas together. So it's a uniform approach right across the globe. There's the thing again. Anybody who's got Mahonia cross media in the garden, something like perhaps Mahonia charity, this is one of the parents coming directly from China. Students again, students have been part of my life really. And I was very lucky because on two occasions, I was actually asked to teach in China. And there are, they were lovely people. They were in fact students from all over China. And they were very interested to meet each other because you know, China is a vast place and they had such tell stories to tell each other. And they're very, very enthusiastic. And it was, it was given to me to try and my colleague in the middle there, um, Keith in the middle there with a thumbs up. We were tasked with trying to teach them quite a bit of practical horticulture in, in the Western way. And um, it was very good fun. And I was incredibly impressed by some of the um, linguists they had there who could more or less give you an instant tra instantaneous translation from English to Chinese and back again. And it was very odd. We had an almost you know, normal conversation between ourselves and the Chinese students. And we had some very lively moments. I mean, without any um, need to be derogatory at all, their idea of health and safety and pruning and pruning trees. Well, I just hope we've um, perhaps made them think about their ways of it because, oh dear, there was quite frightening some of the things we were seeing. Moving on, another place I've visited and has influenced me a lot is going way down to southernmost China, to tropical China, and visiting the Yishuan Wanger tropical botanical gardens, fantastic place to visit, not known by many people, but the main botanical garden, the most important one, I think, in China. It's set right down south, it's tropical, and you can see here, I think this picture sets the scene for you, where you've got the river, Luso, bordering the botanical gardens, it's sluggish, it moves along slowly on its way to the sea extremely humid, very hot, but just great for growing tropical plants. And here we go. This is the entrance. It's extremely well maintained and it's got a fantastic collection of palms. There's Roystonia regia, which is a sort of really impressive one, but they've got so many you wouldn't believe it because palms are incredibly important uh, from a world point of view. They've got a big collection and they've got collections of other plants, which if you're a botanist, you get really excited about. They've got a huge collection of cycads, some of which you're looking at maybe, well, there may be 10 individuals of that species and they've got maybe five in this botanical garden. So it is important. And there they've got a lovely research set up as well. And um, well, I don't think it's giving any secrets away that a lot of their work there is pharma pharmaceutical research. They're taking the plants of which they've got all around them, this huge diversity, and trying to find what, um, you know, possible new drugs and things they can find from these plants. So we might want to discuss that. I would say as well, up until recently, there were English researchers sponsored by the British government working there as well on things like orchids, which they're still discovering in China just to show you that some of the plants, the tropical waters they have, water lilies they have growing there, a big collection and of very big uh, bamboos. Here's one of the biggest in the world, Dendrocalamnus sinicus. You can see I put the people in there for a bit of scale and it grows that much in a year. The bamboos are amazing. They will produce their culm 
to the total length in one growing season. So that's coming up from the ground, shooting up, producing that shoot you can see. And then in the second year, it produces its branches and you get more leaves as well. But the rate of growth, almost frightening. They've also got a um, tropical rainforest reserve there. And I uh, was lucky to be able to get a good trudge, trudge through that and have a look at it. It's still more or less pristine. And here it's actually on a, a rock fall, a limestone rock formation. So you can look down on the river and get a sight. And you can see there, hopefully, if you look into the trees, they're absolutely covered with epiphytes. So, you know, lots of research to be done there lots of plants to see and lots of excitement. I mean, for instance, here, the Chinese are rather annoyed with me in, in some ways because I went once to this wild elephant preserve in the tropical part um, near the um, botanical gardens. They'd been many times and never seen an elephant. I went there on this one occasion and dear old Nelly, there she goes, she just came out of the jungle she was totally oblivious. She didn't know we were there. And we had the pleasure of just seeing this wild elephant eating. And I was so impressed with those bamboos you can see out of the side. Very strong. And she just got hold of the trunk as though they were just like ordinary grass and just put them in her mouth, munched them up. Incredibly strong animals. Still staying in China, another place which has been quite instrumental in my thoughts was the cast landscape in Gulin, in eastern China, almost right by the sea. I'll just take you there quickly. There we are, we're on the River Li, and we're actually on the river, passing this fantastic cast um, scenery there. Just a couple of shots to give you a bit of an idea. The bamboo forest in some places comes right up to the river itself. So you can just see bamboo as far as the eye can go. And then you've got these wonderful formations as well. Uh, it wasn't, you can see the picture, it wasn't the best of the weather. It's normally warm, but we went there, I think, in November because of other circumstances, just a little bit chilly, but usually very pleasant, very warm. Then I've also had traveling, tra traveling quite a bit in the Himalayas in Yunnan, mainly plant hunting. Um, it has been useful for me in teaching because you can see where plants grow, under what conditions they're growing in the wild, and then relate that to what you might, you know, problems you might find, obviously, trying to grow these things in the UK or in a different environment. And then we've got muggins, uh, just to prove I really have been, <laughs> really have been there, and we're way up in the Chinese Himalayas. Some of you may have been here, and you can see the city, or little town, I should say, really, of Detch in there. Very interesting place. It's really on one of the very few roads leading from. Um, China actually into parts of some Tibet. And also quite interesting, you can see a really mountain there. That is the Milai Shu Shan at over, well, it's nearly 7,000 meters high, and it's the tallest mountain in Yunnan and still unclimbed. There's lots of sad stories about people trying in parties to climb it, but nobody has yet. Um, just to show you some of the landscape, here we're on a pass on the Bay Mai or the White Horse Snow Mountain. This just happens to be on the um, leeward side, so very often you find the winds are coming and the rain is coming from the southwest. So on, the, on that facing side it's wet, on the other side it's very often very dry as you can see here. But you do also get lovely plants even on the dry side. Here we've got a lovely gentian, silestris, you see flowering. It was quite dry, but plants still growing there. And then moving on, oopsie, sorry, we go on the other side. We're on the, the by my pass, but up high on the wetter side. And you can see some of the gang there. I should say I took students for many years over there. I thought I was doing a little bit for international relations because our students could at least attempt to talk to some of the PhD students uh, through perhaps translators. And, Realise they had a bit in common, but we look in the past here and we find some nice plants like these louseworts or pedicularis. There's lots of different ones. There we are, rather a nice one there, the bright yellow flower. I think, yeah, that's my favourite, pedicularis siphonantha. 
But these plants, we barely find them in the UK, you find a few more in Europe, but in, in China and in Tibet, you have hundreds, if not thousands, and they have professors of particularis who have just spent their whole life studying this group of plants. There's not only a lot of species, they're interested in the genetics, but also they're semi-parasitic, so their nutrition is interesting as well. Moving on quickly, I've been to Tibet, I'd love to go back. Um, it's a fascinating place. There are still lots of plants being discovered. I was with two professors and gleefully they said, what do you think of these, Duncan? And I looked at the plant collection of plants, I didn't know one of them. I couldn't even put them in Jembra. So there's exciting things. Here we are in Tibet, fairly high up on the path there. And you do find some interesting plants, extremely dry in places, but even where it's dry, you've got things like this Mechanopsis serigula. In this particular plant was about two inches high or five centimeters high. I've grown it in my garden and it must have been 60 centimeters high. So the environment really affects the development of the plant. And going up, we did some trekking. Here we are trekking upwards um, towards, not actually up Everest, obviously, but towards Everest there. We found some good plants, things like Rosa macrophylla, a very beautiful plant in its own right. Unfortunately, I did get altitude sickness on the trip. So I had, it's funny how things that when they go wrong, they often turn out to be beneficial. And I had the opportunity of spending, I think it was nearly a week, camping outside this um, village of Yolok. And that wasn't really any sufferance because my guide who stayed with me, he said, well, would you like to meet the Tibetans? So I actually went into some of these houses and through the tea, uh, through the um, translator, had tea with them and chatted about things and learned an awful lot about their lifestyle. And um, we can talk about that. Some of it, I'm afraid, is a bit political, but it's almost inevitable. But also the way they made a living and what they grew and what their main source of income indeed was. Here you can see the, the headman's house and uh, various people milling around. Fascinated to see how they, they manage the houses. The little sort of stockade in the front, you can see, that's where they keep the cattle in the winter. And when it gets really cold, they actually go underneath. You can see just behind that chap with the basket, you can go in underneath the, where the living rooms are. And the idea is the cattle are protected. Some of the heat goes upwards and helps to make things a bit warmer in the winter. And then on that trip, I was lucky enough, we did actually go to Everest Base Camp. And you can see there Everest, we certainly didn't go any nearer, but it was interesting. And one thing I shall never forget is how quickly the weather changes. I can tell you honestly that a minute before that, Everest was covered in cloud. Two minutes later, the cloud had gone and you could see it like that. And it was literally breathtaking to see how the weather just changed. Climbers talk about it, but to see it, it makes it come really home. We got finally to Lhasa as well, not to be forgotten. I was due to go there again this year, but of course things have fallen apart. Hopefully things, relations will get better and one can go back. And I'll finish on then perhaps, we've been to Tibet, so I thought I ought to end up with this plant, Gentiana Tibetica, a lovely thing. Well, there we are folks. I don't know how long I've spoken for, but just some of the things that I've experienced enjoyed and are still studying and interested in through my career in horticulture. There we are. So uh -huh, that's it. Noel's okay. thank you. There he is. Thank there you. he is. Thank you. That was that was great. No, um, <clears throat> I, I had no idea what you were going to be showing us. So uh, it was a very pleasant surprise to have all of that uh, pleasant Chinese. surprise. I'm glad you said that, Noel. <laughs> we've had a couple of we've had a couple of um I think we've just had two Chinese origin uh, events, uh, one of which actually is from a very dear friend who's an academic who didn't want the talk to be archived because she, being an academic, she didn't want anything to be kind of held against if she was stepping out of, you know, sort of oh, like, for without having yeah, to sort of well, justify that. everything. But anyway, um, no, I'll send you a copy of that. No, I think yeah. those Chinese gardens are so extraordinary in design terms, you know, very, very challenging. Um, 
I, I know mean, you've been there. I saw an article. Yes, you yeah, with yes, the pandemic. Yes. I mean, um, I mean, do you know of any Western designers who've really been able to take any of that, uh, any of those different perspectives on board? Because it's a, such, such a totally different relationship to perspective, really, isn't it? It's, it's it is. It really makes you. I found no I expect you makes you think, and it makes you think how they thought the best part of millennium ago. You know, mm-hmm. centuries ago, what was going through their thought processes and how they how they appreciated the garden. Mm-hmm. It's really on a totally different sort of wavelength. But it, 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 can you bring that to Western horticulture? And if you do. I think it must have beneficial effects. Would you agree, Noel? Well, I, I, I thought uh, the key thing really was, was designing gardens in small spaces. Now, that's what a lot of those gardens in, in Suzhou and the uh, towns well, around you know, were very good at maximising the use of space in, in ways that um, you know, would never have occurred to Western designers. The uh, idea of experience the garden in a, a sort of a, a series of views, uh, and exactly. seeing something and being guided around, virtually being guided, you know, more or less forced to follow a path, but yes. having a series of views. Mm-hmm. What a nice, nice idea. Yeah. And also on, on, on China, I don't know whether you're, ever crossed with James Hitchmore, who I know has made something like 60 trips to China over the last 10 years, and has, I think, done a lot of consultancy work in China with people working with, with native plant seed mixes on, on a really big scale. And have you come across any of that at all in the South? Was it, you know, perhaps I've, been, more... I've been to the Edinburgh Research Station yeah, yeah. on the Green Jade Dragon Mountain and spoken yes. with them mm. and have met some of the uh, Edinburgh staff that are perf- yes. permanently there now, yeah, advising yeah. the Chinese yeah, on yes. trying to restore things and mm, mm, nature mm. conservation generally. So yeah, I've got more than a passing interest in that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, it's nice to see Spetchley Park, which I think is a hugely underrated British garden, very, um, very kind of English plantsman, undesigned um, accumulation of centuries. Well, oh, centuries, yeah, literally yeah, accumulation, yeah, yes. Many yeah. decades of, of, of planting and, and um, yeah, as I say, sort of naturalized bulbs and lilies and things. There, it's, yeah, it is a very special place, especially. I, 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 it's I, a very warm spot in my heart. Yeah, and yes, yes. I take a little bit of issue when you say it's undesigned. I think it's it's its, its own design. Yes, it's sort of just. And the, the fact, I mean, I, I don't mean this in a derisory way as well. It's slightly unkempt. Uh, yes, exactly. Yes, it, but it I, should I, be I, because that's actually, you know, it, if it was just spick and span, it would lose an awful lot. Oh, on the subject of being kempt or in, uh, unkempt, uh, or I suppose one would say kempt, although we never use that word in English. Um, but no, Wisley has always struck me as, as grossly overkempt, you know, apart from Oakwood in the middle. Uh, although the last couple of times I've been, I've noticed certain areas of Wisley, they really seem to be letting go and um, letting a few things sort of spread and intermingle and uh, seed around which um you know all to the all, 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 all to the good i think all to the good yeah yeah it, uh, yes there is a wind of change i think howling through wisley the whole time these days yes yeah no, i mean there's a succession of buildings i talk about but also a succession of curators yes yes and a, a succession of plants coming and flowing through yes. as well it's very interesting yeah. Oh, now Nina has sent in this comment that she said, I once read that the classic Chinese gardens are accompanied with landscape poetry that's constructed such a way that the reader travels through the garden. Uh, yes, ab- absolutely. Um, those Song Dynasty um, scholar gardens, uh, gardening, music, poetry, dance, uh, were all facets of the educated man's uh, painting, ma- the educated man's life, and you wouldn't, they wouldn't have thought of separating off gardening from poetry or gardening from painting. Uh, you had to be, you know, reasonably conversant with, with all of them. Um, 
Yeah, we did have this actually a rather wonderful presentation from my dear friend Yeo Jiang, uh, which I will um, I can sneak through to you, you know, if you like. Um, but it's it's not for for public viewing. But um, yeah, she, she's um, you know you might find that 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 interesting. Uh, we'll we'll have to try and do something else on Chinese gardens sometime one day. Maybe if, uh, if we can get hold of a designer, somebody who's actually able to think more about them in in, in design terms, that might be. Actually no, well, if I can say you you're quite yes. right about the combination of the the, the scholar train brain and all that yeah. and the, the different arts they appreciated and on one occasion I went to a, the best garden in Wuxi yes. and they knew we were coming the, the, the dignitaries in, in that particular city knew they were coming and I shall never forget they took us in the garden it was beautifully quiet and then all of a sudden this lady started playing I think I'm the Chinese lute Oh, how wonderful. And how wonderful. singing as well. Yeah. How and it wonderful. was absolutely yes. magical. Yes, yes. And you could go back centuries to as it was. It was mm -hmm. absolutely wonderful. Yes. I shall yes. never forget that. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, Chinese opera. I think it's terrible. This was very, very, very beautiful indeed. Yes, and yes. Lovely to, to see. And it, you know, it makes you think how it must have been. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. Because it's these days they're so crowded and although... Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So vast numbers of Chinese tourists were there. To, well, at least when I went there, they were still using loudspeakers. Um, on the one hand, you think, well, actually, this is fantastic. These people, you know, a lot of them from the provinces were, for the first time ever in Chinese history, able to see these places. Uh, with, you know, that that's something really, is really fantastic. But I mean, the downside is that yes, it's very, it can be very crowded and very noisy, and they were, as you say, places that were not you know, not designed to be opened up to no, it, it, like it us. Is, <laughs> it's a problem, and it, you can relate that to places like Kunming, which is one of the most famous botanical gardens. Yes, yes. Mm, um, but <laughs> the chap who runs it, the director, was saying we have a problem. I said, "What's that?" He said, "They're now so popular." With the Chinese, yes, yes. they're in very much in quite danger of destroying the one thing they're coming to visit. I know, yes, and but because their whole politics is everybody must have free open to yes. access to everything. Yes, yes. So how do they sort of square the circle? Because they've got to preserve, and it's, it's something they perhaps are coming to terms with. But it's an interesting. Oh, it's a bit like the Sissinghurst problem with knobs on. You know. Absolutely, only about ten times worse. Yes, and I mean, I, I, I might get criticised. Whistley is becoming a little bit like that as well very very heavily visited indeed mm, mm. and whether you restrict numbers or time tickets yeah. they do it i don't know i'm old enough to remember wisley before the m25 um oh, yes. yes and it was it was a very sort of then when they then they opened up the m25 you know people really came in and that gift shop really took off oh <laughs> gift interesting shop. but i mean again <clears throat> as a designer you'd appreciate this i can remember remember wisley when the paths were maybe using old money and uh, maybe two or three feet wide yeah, and designed yeah. for one person to walk yes, around the garden yes, yes and of course then it was quite a different experience like a vast sort of cottage garden yes but now if you build any paths in wisley they're what meters wide yeah, of course, yes, 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 and yes. that of course changes the atmosphere i think in uh, the... yes very very much so I mean, so so many of the gardens we um praise or talk about or emulate or love are, are designed well most of them really for 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 private access individuals yeah uh, and if they were not designed for private access we still read them i think as grossly bombastic I and mean, versailles being, being, a, being a good example or any of those baroque gardens but they can absorb enormous numbers of people yeah. because they were designed for fetch on pet, but they, they you never escape this kind of bombastic sense of, of power being I I expressed. Oh, I see. We've got 10 people on the chat. Shall we take a couple of questions? Hey, well, we this is all comments, really. I and mean, people just say very right. interesting about China. Thank you for the trip down memory lane, Su Zhou. Uh, if you're touring with Peter Wharton in Yunnan, uh, absolutely breathtaking. Um, some discussion of Mahoney and Lomarifolia. <coughs> um, Yep. Um, yeah, and, and Nina's comment that in, in the United States, or indeed anywhere outside of L London, I believe you can get the best of Chelsea because you see the broadcast recorded without the crowds. Yes, don't go to Chelsea. Watch, watch it all on, on a 
on the screen. That's a bit, that's a bit strong. <laughs> Making us one of the very, I had an extremely privileged life. And one of the things I went round on Monday on the press. Oh, yes. I expect yes. you've done as well, Norman. Well, yeah, so, uh, for three years I exhibited there. They had a little nursery that was. Um, there you are, you see. Yeah, and that, that was definitely, definitely the best time. I'm afraid it is because yes. you haven't got the crowds. No, I mean, got, you, you, I mean, you have a lot of kind of you know C-list celebrities kind of. Yeah, well, around. yeah, but you're trying to close have, your mind to that. And, you know, then, then you have the royal family who kind of come in and pretend to be interested, even though we all know they're not. Um, and then that calling thing on Monday evening when all the bankers and financiers come in, which is one of the most extraordinary spectacles in the world for an anthropologist, I think. Um, the box it? might get busy at any moment now. <laughs> <laughs> Some royalists. Well, you've experienced that. That's anything but quiet. Oh, well, there you yes. go. So great, thank you everybody. Um, thank you very much, Duncan. That was great. It's been a, nice been a pleasure. Time. Thank you all. Thank you. I hope enjoyed it. Spent so much time in China and, and, and Tibet. Uh, so that, that's brilliant. And um, onwards and upwards. And oh, Monsi just flagging up. Love to hear that Chinese have the same word for path and joy. Mm. Interesting. Um, uh, for bat, for bat, uh, joy. bat, bat and joy. joy. Yeah. It's a synonym. Uh, yes. Not not path, mate. Bat. You know. <laughs> <clears throat> um, good, good. Okay, well, we'll keep in touch, Duncan. Perhaps we'll get you to do one of our webinars in the winter. Something. There we go of, for you, Noel. Know, there we go. Yeah. Well, great. Brilliant. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Goodbye, yeah. everybody. Bye. Happy gardening. Bye. Happy gardening, everybody. Bye now. Bye. <laughs>